Um, hello everyone. Uh, so you might remember in my last video, if you watched it, that towards the end, I sort of indicated that I wasn't 100% sure where my baby was. This would turn out to be a much bigger deal than I had initially thought it would be at the time. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever taken a type of drug called benzodiazepines, but they are going to play a pretty important role in this story. They're kind of a main character here. So, um, a quick recap of, I think, everything that I talked about in the last video. At that point, I had been in the psych ward for the past 24 hours. Remember this. That's very important. From Wednesday night to Thursday morning, I could not possibly have done anything because I was in the psych ward under constant supervision by everybody in the hospital. I think they probably know more about what happened to me during that time than I do. Um, my wife was in the maternity ward recovering from her C-section. Uh, and the last time I saw the baby, I had handed it to my mother-in-law because um, I realized that I got banned on TikTok and then I was dealing with that emotionally. So I handed the baby to my mother-in-law. Um, my in-laws have been staying with us. So basically me, because remember my wife's been in the hospital this whole time in her penthouse suite, um, you know, having the time of her life. Meanwhile, I'm dealing with her parents in our teeny tiny apartment um, for three straight days, whatever it is. So they've been staying with us and I can't, I don't even want to get into all the reasons why they can't afford their own hotel room like a normal family would in this situation because that would involve me um, doing a 40-hour video about all of the mistakes they've ever made in the history of their whole family lineage and I don't have time to do that. But basically, long story short, they're staying with us. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you guys have ever been in that situation where you have company and people are staying with you and there's not really a whole lot for you guys to do besides dinner and lunch, you know? So but in between that, it's kind of awkward. You're just sitting around and nothing's really going on and you're just waiting for the next meal. Um, so I was in my car making the video and there wasn't really anything for me to do besides go home to where my in-laws probably were, and I don't want to just sit around with them in the living room and talk about the same five things we've been talking about our whole lives. Um, so I said, I, I, I wanted to kind of just kill some time, and I told, I texted them, I said, I'm going to run some errands before I get home. I'm out of the hospital. Um, my wife is fine. I don't want to say her name because I'm trying to... People around in my periphery don't really like to get attention on the internet like I do. So I like to kind of keep them out of it. I said, my wife is fine. She's in the hospital. She's having some complications with her C-section, but I think everything's going to be fine. I'm going to run some errands, which if you ever hear me say that, just know it's a crock of shit because it probably means I'm just running around town with my dick in my hands, basically, because I don't want to do something else. Um, so I... I've just been kind of, I, I go start like walking around the mall. I go to Target for no reason and walk around there. And I'm, you know, like I said, just killing time. And then the sun goes down and I figure, okay, it's almost dinner time. So I guess I'll go back home and we'll get dinner. And then I can just go straight to bed. Bing, bang, boom. Um, <clears throat> I go home, open the door. The first thing that my mother-in-law says to me is, how was your day with the baby? And I look at her and I say, excuse me, how was your day with the baby? You're the ones who have had it this whole time, right? And they say, no, you're the one who's had it this whole time. So now my mother-in-law is very histrionic, which means that she overreacts to things. And she's already doing some of her best work right now. 
Um, because before I even know it, she's got her phone out and she's trying to call the cops. So I grab the phone out of her hand and I, and I say to the operator, I don't know what this lady just told you, but disregard it because there's no problem. We've got it all under control. Goodbye. Hang up the phone, throw in the garbage disposal. Um, and now my in-laws are freaking out and I'm trying to explain to them, you're the ones who messed up here. Because the last time I checked, the last thing I remember, you were holding the baby. So it was your responsibility. And then they told me, the hospital people told us that after you got out of the psych ward, you were going to get the baby and take it home. And I said, well, why are you listening to the hospital people about what I'm going to do? Nobody ever told me that. I was in the psych ward laid up on God knows what. So that's probably another part of the story that probably the drug use I'm about to tell you about partially wasn't even my fault. Um, but I was laid up for the whole 24 hours under constant supervision. So how could I have done anything? Explain that to me. Um, so they said that the hospital people told them that my baby, they had to do some tests or whatever they do with babies over the, over the next night. So they left the baby with the hospital and they went back to my apartment. Already a red flag because they don't have a key to my apartment. According to them, they came back to my apartment and stayed the night in my apartment without me while I was in the psych ward. So already, hmm, put a pin in that one. Um, so... I say, well, the baby's probably the hospital then. Let's go to the hospital. And as I'm thinking about my next move, I'm starting to realize that m m something is going on with my in-laws. I'm not exactly sure that I can, that I should trust them completely in this situation. At the end of the day, I have to look out for numero uno, which is me. So I say, I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to kind of like get them off my back, but not raise any alarm bells. Because if they did something, then they're probably going to be trying to pin it on me. Because that's what I would do. I would, I'm trying to pin it on the other. That's, no, I'm not saying that that's what I'm doing. I'm just saying if I did something and I was in their situation, I would try to pin it on me. So I said, you know what? Why don't you guys just stay here and relax? I'm going to go to the hospital because you're right. It is my responsibility. It's not. I'm just trying to tell them what they want to hear so that they leave me alone. So I say, I'm going to go to the hospital. Don't even worry about it. I go to the hospital. I get to the hospital. My in-laws are already there. So they, they have their own car. So they must have been driving 100 miles, 150 miles an hour down the freeway if they got to the hospital before me um, because I, I was trying to drive the speed limit and obey traffic laws because I've been in enough trouble with the law as it is uh, my entire life. So I don't need a, a traffic ticket on top of all of this. So they, it looks like they've been talking to the hospital people for a while. So I go in and I say, okay, everybody in this room has five seconds to explain to me what's going on before I go ape shit. And uh, the hospital people say, they don't know where the baby is either, which is crazy to me. And I, 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 honestly, it's not that crazy to me because if you remember when my when the situation with my ex happened last year, this is the same hospital. It's the same gaggle of people. And this hospital is a breeding ground of malpractice and incompetence. I told my wife over and over again, whatever we do, we cannot go to that hospital because when we have the baby, otherwise they're going to ruin our lives. And look, I'm right again. Um, so I ask them, do you mean to tell me that you don't keep any kind of log book or record of who brings babies in and out of this building? And they're behind the desk Everybody's, it's, it's like an anthill back there. Everybody's running around, looking through papers, acting like they're doing something, being proactive. I've had service industry jobs before. So believe me, I know what pretending to work looks like. And that's what they're doing right now. So they're flipping through books. They're saying, they're whispering to each other. And um, I'm trying to say, hello, can somebody explain to me what's going on? 
The hospital people say that it's probably prudent to get the police involved at this point. And I say, no, absolutely not. You can get the police involved, but I am not gonna deal with this right now. This baby is not my responsibility. I've had the worst 48 hours of my life. Little did I know I was gonna end up having the worst 72 hours of my life. So I say, I'm going home and I'm getting some sleep because I haven't slept in two days. So I try to leave. Some guys, blocking me at the door. He's saying, no, we got to figure this out. I'm saying, I'm a sovereign citizen. Get out of my way. You can't stop me from doing whatever the hell I want. I'm not under arrest. I didn't do anything wrong. I go home and I get to my apartment and I see red and blue flashing lights. The cops are there. And I'm remembering, crap, my mother-in-law, I guess the call must have gone through. So they have responded to they, I go up to them and I say, what's going on? And they say, um, we are, we got a call from what sounded like a domestic dispute between an old lady and a young man. Uh, so we just wanted to come and, and check and see if everything was okay. And I told them, yeah, everything's fine. There's nothing to worry about. So they say, great. And they leave. That's the LAPD for you. So thank God. Uh, in this case, that was a good thing for me. Um, so I go in that apartment, lock the doors, shut the blinds, and I am prescribed some things to help me with <clears throat> um, anxiety. I have a lot of anxiety and uh, insomnia. I have a lot of trouble sleeping. So I am prescribed a lot of, of um, things to help me deal with those kinds of issues, basically. Uh, so I am, of course, really wound up and I say to myself, if there's ever a time to take these pills, it's now. So I took some medication and I lay my head down on the pillow. Okay. Bam. All of a sudden it's the morning and I look around me. I'm getting my bearings. I say, wow, I slept pretty good last night. And I realize it's not Friday morning like it's supposed to be. That was Thursday night that I was just explaining. I looked at my phone. It's Saturday morning. It's this morning. So I fell asleep on Thursday night. So now I'm realizing that 36 hours are missing. For me, I don't, I have no clue what happened in those 36 hours, Thursday night to Saturday morning. And unfortunately, this isn't the first time that this has happened. I kind of have a lot of experience with this because um, benzodiazepines, like I explained earlier, uh, and opiates, especially if you put them together, they have a funny way of kind of um, playing tricks on your perception and uh, your sense of the passage of time. If you've ever seen the movie Memento, a lot of times it feels like that where you'll all of a sudden be in a place, you have no clue how you got there and you have to use context clues to piece together what happened in the events leading up to what you're currently experiencing. So normally the first thing I do in this situation is I check my phone and I go into my text messages and my photo gallery. To, to see if there's, you know, sometimes maybe I can, I can look at my texts and the photos I've taken and the things I've so on, posted on social media and I can see what happened, but there's nothing. So, so either I or somebody else went through and deleted all my text messages, all my pictures and all my social media posts. You guys would know better than me if I posted anything in that time frame. Um, so no, that's no help there. I'm walking around my apartment. There's no in-laws. So they're not here. Their suitcases aren't here. Their shoes aren't here. None of their stuff is here. Their car's not here. So they're not here. My wife's not here. And the baby's not here. So I'm alone. Nobody's here. Um, I peer out the blinds and my car is in the normal parking spot, but it has a huge dent in it. Your guess is as good as mine where that came from. So that kind of brings me to right now, you may have noticed that 
um, it, I'm in a pretty beautiful view, and that's because I'm in the Angeles National Forest, which is right outside of LA. This is kind of where I go when I need to kind of take a breath and um, have some time to myself and think about things, process things. There's no cell, re there's no cell reception out here. Um, so it gives you a lot of peace and quiet because you know your phone's not going to go off and, and people aren't going to be trying to get in, you know, bothering you about all sorts of things. Um, so I'm kind of just getting my bearings and I wanted to make this video right now because I have a feeling that shit is really going to hit the fan for me today. So I wanted to make sure that I got out my side of the story be before anybody else has the chance to get ahead of it and twist around what happened in a way that I don't have any control over. So you heard it from me first, what happened? Everything I said is true because I would have no reason to lie to you people. I don't know what happened to me. Whatever happened to me, it wasn't my fault because I wasn't even in control of my actions. Not saying that anything did happen. I'm just saying that that in the legal system, there is, my lawyer has explained this to me many times. If you are under the influence of certain medications and psychiatric illnesses, which I do have both of those things, then there is a limit to the responsibility legally of whatever you did under that, in that state. Basically, it's called diminished responsibility, diminished capacity. Um, so just remember that because I'm not, like I said, I'm not saying I did anything. I'm just saying that you know what? I'm not even going to keep talking about this because I feel like I'm keep digging a bigger and bigger hole for myself. So I'm, I'm just going to say I'll keep you updated when I know something. But right now, I don't know anything. You guys would probably know more about me, about things than I would that have happened in the past 24 hours because I don't know anything that happened in the past 24 hours. So um, as far as my TikTok goes, unfortunately, it's looking like I'm probably not going to get that back. But um that is the one sort of silver lining. If there's any sliver of good news um, to all this, it's that uh, my friends in Washington have been kind of working their magic. So I have a lot of tendrils in a lot of different places and uh, people take really good care of me, basically. Um, so that's good. Um, so silver lining. I'm always kind of trying to look for the silver linings and things. Uh I guess that's it. I don't know. I mean, I, I'll, I'll keep you updated when something happens. Check my Twitter and my Instagram. Um, you know, thanks for your support on the last video. I will say that overall, I think people could have been more supportive of the last video, but that's okay because I understand that people have a lot of things going on. But I'll say this. What I saw people paying more attention to and thinking was more important than the video that I posted, to me, was not more important. So that's just my opinion. Um, but thank you for the people who were supportive. And I'm hoping that my support will only continue to increase as time goes on. So thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great weekend.